That was smart. So i um, excited about um, being with you this morning. Uh, we're going to be digging into a tough subject, and so I just want to prepare you um, that we're going to be walking through um, a difficult topic. You know, when we talk about infidelity, when we talk about adultery, there's um, a lot of hurt in the room. There's a lot of people that have been through it. Um, they've been in um, situations where their family has imploded, where par parents have gone, you know, one parent's gone this way, the other parent's gone that way, and there's a lot of broken hearts, a lot of injury represented in this room. And I just want you to know that today um, it is not my heart to heap burdens on you, and I know it's not Jesus either. Jesus wants to set us free and to give us life. And the big story, in, you know, when we, when we talk about infidelity, the bigger story is, is that our God is faithful. And he always comes through, and he is coming back for his bride. And so we want to keep that in focus. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we come before you and we ask that you would speak to everyone here. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We are all coming before you, Lord, guilty of sin. But God, we're grateful that you're willing to give your life to set us free, and to bring us home. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every heart in every specific situation this morning through your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in the middle of a series where we've been walking through the Ten Commandments, and as Rob said, we've, we're on uh, Do Not Commit Adultery. And, you know, last week we talked a little bit about anger, and so it's important to remember that the context of the things that Jesus said about this is overarching in a sermon on the mount, where he actually comes and explains and walks through, okay, here's these laws, and then here's what they mean as far as the human heart, and so I'm going to be walking through that a little bit today. Um, you know, I've, I was a counselor um, and, and a pastor, so I, for a while I was even in private practice, and so I've heard a lot of stories, a lot of stories of infidelity, a lot of heartbreaking stories. And uh, over the years, in about 20 years of walking alongside folks, I just want to encourage you that if you're in the middle of or in the midst of something really painful, there is hope, there is redemption, and I've seen couples survive infidelity and stay together and thrive. And they are doing fantastic, and God can do a miracle even in the most messy situations. But the kinds of things that I would hear people say when they would come and they would talk to me about infidelity in their relationship is they'd say things like, you couldn't brace yourself because you never saw it coming. Or you didn't have your guard up because you thought you were safe. It never crossed your mind that the person you loved, that the person that you trusted, that you felt safe with would ever hurt you in this way. So because of that, you gave your heart completely your love, your loyalty, your trust, and all of that is shattered. Nothing makes sense. You frantically start questioning even yourself, um, thinking through the shock, the lies, the deception. And oftentimes it can lead to a playing it over and over and over again in your mind, where it's like, okay, what happened? How did this happen? And it's a lot like the symptoms of PTSD where you keep thinking over the what happened, what happened, what happened, and then maybe even find yourself checking your phone or trying to see where the person is all the time because now there's this constant insecurity and fear. And it's traumatic. It, it breaks people's hearts and does unbelievable harm, not only to the couple, but to their family and oftentimes dissolves into divorce, although that is not always the case. I want to tell you guys a story of infidelity with a little bit of a redemptive ending. Um, one of the couples that I was counseling, um, this would have been many years past, was uh, going through uh, this unbelievably difficult time, and I was meeting with them, working through the relationship. And because of the conflicts in the relationship and because of what was going on, um, there was actually uh, the, the woman had an affair with the man that was across the street. And so this came out. And we started working through the, the, the betrayal and the, and the 
trauma of that, and we're working through. And, and it was an awful situation because, you know, not only um, did he have to deal with, wow, I'd, we're, you know, I, I can't trust you, what happened, and just all the normal things that you would think, but every day when he drove home, this person lived straight across the street. And so he's having all this confusion in his mind, and they, they, but she was completely repentant. She felt terrible about what she had done, and she wanted to make things right. She wanted to work through it. And so um, they started working through um, in counseling how to um, love one another, forgive one another, and move on th through the wreckage. And um, at one point, the guy from across the street started coming across to try to talk to her. And the husband confronted him and said, you can't ever cross. So he just went right in the middle of the street and said, here's the line. <laughs> you know, don't cross this line. And he kept walking across and talking to her when she would go to get in her car. And she would feel all confused, like, should I tell my husband? Because he's going to do something crazy. But I don't want to lie to him because now he doesn't trust me. And so I was kind of in the middle of hearing all these things. And, and um, he wouldn't stop coming to talk to her. So one day he crossed the line again to talk to her, and he went over there and he just beat the living tar out of this guy. Yeah, something inside of us just feels good when we hear this story. And just beat him bloody. I mean, this guy was a mess. And so then the, the wife calls me and she's all upset and traumatized because not only, you know, it's like I wrecked my marriage and now my husband's going to go to jail. And like, I mean, his, his career's going to be ruined. Like, and so she's horrified and, and um, you know, this would have been in northern Idaho, and so the northern Idaho police showed up, and, and they came, and they heard the situation and everything, and this guy's like, I'm pressing charges because, you know, this guy beat me up, so this guy's just a scumbag on all levels, right? And the police kind of looked around, and they heard the story, and they said, well, sounds like you shouldn't cross this line <laughs> ever again. And they went, and they left. A little bit of Idaho justice. <laughs> I love it. So there is, there's something inside of our hearts that feels good when there's, you know, a little bit of justice. But like when, you know, when this, these kinds of things happen, when things fall apart, it's, it's often very messy. And please don't hear me encouraging you to go out and do violence. Um, I, I, that's, this is a cautionary tale, right? It's, it, praise God that he didn't go to prison. <laughs> but you, th you think about just when you walk through these kinds of experiences with people, you just get to see, you know, just how fragile our hearts are and how much we, we trust and our, when that trust is broken, what it does. So um, marriage was always the original design. I just want to touch on this really quick. Some people are confused because they, they see that Abraham had more than one wife or they'll, or they'll see that David had more than one wife and they'll say, is polygamy okay? Is, it, is this... God agreeing with that this is okay? And the answer is no. The original design was always one man and one woman, two genders, by the way, one man, one woman, together for life. That was the plan. And that clear plan in the Word of God was always the case. But whenever the breakdown of that happened because of sin, you will see that the results in Scripture of polygamy is always a nightmare. You don't have to explain it because it's obvious that over and over and over again, it is a train wreck, and that mess is really clear, and, and it's also clarified by God himself at the very beginning in Genesis and also by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, this is Jesus speaking. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. If there's any ambiguity there, there's, not, there's nothing unclear about Jesus is affirming the institution of marriage. And when he speaks about marriage, it's such an important piece of culture. We take it for granted that culture itself will fall apart without the institution of marriage. Marriage is such an important, integral part of what holds everything together, and it is an unbelievably huge gift that God has given us of clarity, which is this is how this should work. It's a covenant. 
Now, what is a covenant? A covenant is just basically you take an animal, and this would be this, that you can see this when God is speaking to Abraham and he gives him this, he lays it out clearly. Um, and in ancient cultures, this would have made total sense. Is you take an animal and you cut it in half, you put half the animal over here and you put half the animal over here and you line them up in a row and this makes like this pathway and just blood everywhere, right? So just picture this <laughs> scary, bloody, cut in half animals, okay? And a covenant was is that we would agree on something and then we would both stand next to each other and walk through that bloody mess and come to the other side. And then the understanding and the handshake would be, if you break this covenant, that's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to cut you in half. That's what a covenant is. You don't hear it a lot of, in a lot of wedding ceremonies, you know, but maybe we should because I think people are kind of forgetting what the vows are. You know, it's like the vows are so important. It's like, why are they in there? Why have we over time started, you know, in history collected these vows? Because people are the worst. People are terrible. They will do horrible things to one another. And we know that. So that's why the vows are sicker, you know, in sickness and in health, rich or poor. Like it goes through until death do we part. It's so clear because you're making a covenant not only before God, but before people. You're saying that you are committing for the rest of your life to be with this person. And think about what, what a relationship is like that doesn't have that kind of commitment. When that commitment is not there, it just already is starting to fall apart immediately. When you do not have the, the commitment of marriage and the promise that I'm going to stick with you through thick and thin no matter what, and that's the covenant that God makes with us, and it's also the covenant that he expects us to keep in our relationships with one another. And so, you know, you see it clearly in Matthew chapter 19, this covenant. And then over, as we keep going, we, we think about um, the reality is, is just that marriage is hard. You know, I, I wish, you know, to, you know the, all the young people in here, I want to encourage you because it, it is very difficult and totally worth it to stick for the rest of your life and be married. But just everyone knows, right, in the room, that it is very hard to be married. And, you know, there's a lot of research in, in marital satisfaction, marital happiness, and they've compiled it all. And you, you can track it pretty easily. It's not hard to track. It, just, it starts out, and it's just it's really high. Marital satisfaction starts out. And then about, you know, a couple weeks in, it's like, whoo. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> I have, I, I, uh, what did I do here? And, and, and what you'll see is that the, you know, if you take all of the, not everybody's the same, but if you take all of it and add it all together, you'll see that on the chart, it kind of goes, makes a big drop off right at the beginning. The expectations were here, the reality is here. And then over time, it starts to go up again, and then you have children, and it goes down, <laughs> predictably. And you can't breathe, you can't sleep, it's hard, you know, and then there's a long period where it's kind of in the middle there, and then it starts working its way back up to marital satisfaction, you know, and this is time, it works its way up to here, and then you have teenagers, <laughs> and it has another drop. And so you, you see this, this trend of life is hard, marriage is hard, but over the course, this is what a lot of people miss, this is when it really gets good, and it goes up, 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 up. And in fact, the highest levels of marital satisfaction are at the end of the relationship because you are finally learning how to love someone. It takes a lifetime to learn how to love someone. And so I say that for grace, but I also say that for the reality, which is so important to remember that it's like marriage is like fine wine. It's like the older it is, the better it gets. And so hang in there is, is, the, is the vision. Because you might go through some really low lows. But if you can just wait and hang in there, there's some really high highs on the other side. You know, in the classic book, The Scarlet Letter, uh, there was a, a woman who, she gets pregnant in her village. And um, everyone knew that she had committed adultery because she was pregnant. And so they, they gave her this big red letter A for adultery that she had to wear around. And we have some in the back for everybody that has committed adultery. <laughs> Just kidding. I didn't think I could make a joke about this, but I did. So we're not going to be handing out any big red letter A's to anybody or big D's for divorce, right? You're divorced. So I just want to encourage you that we don't do that here. Um, 
And it's, impor it's important for you to know because as we're heading into these subjects, you know. So we're, I have no heart whatsoever to put shame or heap shame on folks that have gone through all that. It's like you go through that, it is punishment enough. And um, we're not here to throw stones at anybody this morning. And so you just need to know that. But what Jesus says on the subject is very challenging. And we're not going to shy away from what Jesus said at all. So let's go in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21. This is what uh, David preached on last week, which is talking about anger and murder. But in the context, it's important to look at it as a whole. So starting in verse 21, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in the danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And go ahead and scroll down to verse 27. You've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into into hell. Notice that the, the, the theme is Jesus is speaking. Don't forget that this is all set in the Sermon on the Mount. And when he first gets there, there's just this huge mess of bedraggled people just like this room. And don't forget that Jesus is speaking to a big crowd of that are all basically a complete mess. And what he just told them was, these are the kind of people that are going to be in the kingdom. And that the invitation has now gone out to all the normal people that are a mess to now enter into the kingdom life. And so they've already heard some really good news, and then he comes in with some really challenging stuff, which is like, if you're even angry, you're a murderer, right? Jesus sounds mean. He's meaner than Moses, right? It's like, if you're angry, you're a murderer. If you, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery already in your heart. And you can watch the progression of what he's doing here, and I think it's important to look at the progression because no divorce starts anywhere but anger. Look at the whole progression. Anger, which leads to a, an internal murdering, whether it's external or not. That internal murdering is contempt, and that contempt is when you say, you're the worst, you've always been the worst, and you'll never get any better. That is the death sentence, right, to a marriage, is I am so contemptuous of you that there's no hope for you, it's over. And, and you can watch it actually progress from anger to contempt, right? And then from that contempt to kind of murderous thoughts. And then from there to lust. And then from lust to divorce as you watch the progression and the disintegration of the family. The family disintegrates from the inside out. It starts in the heart. And Jesus is making a parallel that the internal Thing that's going on in your heart is the bigger issue. The external actions, right, that we do are actually a result of internal things that are already happening. So lust equals committing adultery in your heart. So what is lust exactly? You know, as I was looking at the Ten Commandments, I thought it was interesting that actually one of the commandments, which is coveting, lists don't covet your neighbor's wife. And so what's the difference between lust and coveting. Well, the, when you covet, you, you just want something, right? But when you lust, what is, what's the difference between that? Or what's the difference between lust and idolatry? Where you look at something higher than you ought to, where you make something bigger than it is. The distinction is really clear. Coveting is when you want something that's not yours. Idolatry is trusting in something that's not God. Wanting someone else's wife, for instance. But lust is different. Lust is dehumanization of a person into an object. The harm of lust is making a person who was created in the image of God into pleasure, which is harmful to them and harmful to your soul. See, lust begins in the heart, and it is not really necessarily sexual. Lust is the result 
of diminishing the value of what God created. God made them, male and female, he created them. In his image, he created them. God made man and God made woman in his image. And when we lust, what we do is we turn that person into a thing. The truth is, is we're in an epidemic of pornography right now in our culture, and we have to talk about it. We have to take a minute and just really talk about the reality. Because in the past, you'd have to go to the store, or you'd have to go find pornography. You'd have to hunt it down. And the odds of finding it and the shame of it being discovered, it was too easy. But now, it is accessible 24-7, seven days a week, and in almost every single home. It's sweeping the country, and it's now become the major cultivator of lust in the developing world. And the, de the dehumanizing effect of that just can't be measured. What that's doing to our brains, what that's doing to our culture, this lust culture, is, is devastating um, in so many ways, ways we can't even understand. But the consequences of cultivating that lust and really intentionally pursuing it is devastating to your soul, it's devastating to your marriage, and it is devastating to the world. Let me give you some statistics. 25% of search engine requests are related to sex. 35% of downloads from the internet are pornographic. 40 million Americans say they regularly visit porn sites. That's people who say, right, they do that. I can't even imagine. It's way higher than that, than people that wouldn't admit, right, that they do that. One third of all internet porn users are women. This is not just a men issue. Sunday is the most popular day of the week for viewing porn. I know, it's, this is all hard to look at. In the past minute, over 80 million people in America visited a porn site in the United States. 80 million people in the last minute. I mean, pornography is not only wrong in and of itself, because that's bad enough in the harm that it does to your relationships, the harms that it does to you, but it is being complicit in sex trafficking. See, pornography is the advertising arm of the sex industry. It is the advertisement for sex trafficking. Sex trafficking is 100% connected. See, this is very clearly prostitution starting in the mind, leading ultimately to the heart, the degradation of human beings, and then ultimately to slavery. See, this sin is becoming so common and so um, infiltrating into homes that we have to start figuring out as a church, how do we push against the tide of this problem? Because it's an epidemic. So when we dehumanize somebody, when that was, we make them into an object of pleasure rather than a person, that's the real problem of lust. You know, Christians have been ensnared in this as well. A recent study showed that approximately 50% of self-identified Christians say that casual sex between consenting adults is always or sometimes acceptable. This isn't just somewhere out there. Just this past week, 18 men were arrested in Spring Hill for soliciting sex with a minor. Now, 18 men arrested in Spring Hill alone. That, that's just who was caught, let alone all the people who are doing all kinds of horrible things that you can't even imagine, and it's not illegal. You see, this, this, is, this is literally tearing down the very bedrock. It is actually a cancer that is destroying the very fabric of marriage, relationships, and ultimately it is really going to harm um, the next generation, if we don't get a handle on it. You know, Christ most Christians would not allow their teenagers to go into their bedroom, shut the door, and lock it with their girlfriend in there. Would they? I'm pretty confident to say that most of the people in this room would not allow 
their teenagers to do that, I hope. But that's what you're doing when you allow the cell phone in there. See, these, these, the, the technology is dangerous. And we have to start looking at it and admitting, like, what's coming into our homes through television, what's coming in our homes through cell phones, what's coming into our homes is dangerous. And we have to figure out ways to filter it. There's a, there's a software out there called Covenant Eyes that you can get that actually will send a report of everything that you looked at once a week. And anything that's troubled, it flags it, and it sends it to whoever you want it to be sent to that would hold you accountable. There's this software called Circle for your family that you can put in your house that actually filters a lot of the uh, pornographic sites out. And then also you can choose what your kids can and can't look at on their cell phones. Now, there's always a way around all this stuff, and the technology is constantly changing. But the reality is, is that we have to find ways as a culture to get smart about what, how do we put some limits? How do we put some protections in place for our kids and for our marriages? So what about people who are actually right now in this room and they're just trapped in an addictive sexual sin? I'm, I know that there's people in here that are, uh, they're not just struggling with this, they are addicted to it. And I just want to give you um, some encouragement that that, and it won't sound like encouragement, the encouraging word is, you're not going to get out of this by trying harder. It is only by the power of God that you can be set free from addiction. So you're going to need God and you're going to need help. So reach out and get some help. God, you know, Jesus goes on to talk about um, remarriage in verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, this is a hard passage, and I know that there's a lot of people who have been divorced and remarried in this room. And there's a thousand stories, right? Because we can screw this up a thousand different ways, believe it or not. And so it's hard to have a cookie-cutter conversation from the stage about how do we handle each situation. And I know that each one really needs to be looked at individually. I've heard it said that it takes three groups to get married. It should take three groups to get divorced. The three groups would be a couple, right? You've got to have a pastor or a church, and you've got to have the state. And what happens is, is people are getting divorced and they're skipping the church. They'll say, well, they'll break it with irreconcilable differences in their marriage. They'll go to the state and they'll do all the legal work, but they don't come to their church and sit down with the pastor and say, do I have biblical grounds to do this? Am I doing the right thing? It takes all three and so I want to encourage you that when you're walking through something really hard, that you're going to have to reach out and get some help to know how to navigate that situation. There's a lot of crazy situations of abuse, of neglect, of um, just more than you can imagine. And so we can't cover each subject specifically, but what we can do is have grace as a church and not be the kind of place that throws stones at people who are walking through something really, really hard. We need a lot of love and a lot of mercy and a lot of support for folks that are going through difficult problems in their relationships and in their marriages. You know, in Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, Paul actually walks through some circumstances where people are um, abandoned in the relationship, and he's explaining it as a grounds for divorce that when you are basically abandoned, you, you can um, actually come alongside um, and, and walk it out over you. To, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should... Thank you. Remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. So he's given this provision of the situation where people were abandoning their spouses. Or he talks later about people in situations where they're, they're not Christians. But they got married, and one of them's now a Christian, and the other one isn't, and he talks about how to stick together. So you'll see that Jesus is speaking very clearly about what the truth is, and then the church is having to figure out all the thousand ways that it's all screwed up, and it's messed up, and people hurt each other, you know, and, and the reality of walking that out requires some care, 
and some direction and some guidance. And I want to just encourage people that are walking through that, please don't walk, walk through that alone. The clear biblical grounds for divorce are set forth by Jesus Christ and his apostles. And those two are sexual immorality and desertion. You might say, well, what about abuse? What about this? What about this? Are you telling me that? You know, and there's a lot of things that could come next. And that is why I want to encourage you. It's so important that you don't try to figure that out yourself, that every situation is going to look a little bit differently. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, it is so important. This isn't desertion. This is, it's so important to separate, whether even that separation in your home or even separation outside of the home in certain situations, to get safe, to get help, to, to clarify what's going on, because people can harm each other terribly, and you shouldn't just keep staying in that situation. You need to get safe. You need to get healthy. And the goal should be for reconciliation if it's possible. It is always our heart at Grace Chapel when we're coaching people through difficult times that there would be reconciliation. That's our goal. That's our hope. That's our heart. But the reality is, is that that's not always going to happen. Sometimes it's just going to fall apart and it's going to be so shattered it cannot be put back together. And the reality of that takes some wisdom to walk through as well. So don't forget that the law is the pathway. It's the clear way through what we're talking about. And the cliffs are license. Just get divorced for any and every reason, right? And the other cliff is legalism. Let's try to figure out, you know, like a big math problem, how, you know, how to basically shame people that have made mistakes or are in a mess. And we don't want either of those. We really want to walk out what Jesus is saying here. So separation can be a really important tool in the process of reconciliation. I want to encourage people that when you do consider a separation, have a pathway for how you are going to reconcile before you separate. Get some coaching on what that separation could look like so that you can, get, you can actually come around the other side and get back together. And don't use this as an excuse to separate just so that you can desert your spouse. The purpose of separation would be then to work on the relationship and to bring it back together if it's at all possible. I bet a lot of you guys didn't know that God actually went through separation and divorce. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6, it says, The Lord also said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this... Her treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. But there's more to the story. Because some of you have gone through divorce, or you're in the middle of it, or you're heading towards it. And I want to encourage you that God has walked through this. God himself has walked through adultery, being deserted, and he still came back for his bride. He pursued her. He had every right to stay divorced. He separated. He got divorced. He did, the wor he did the work to win her back. And he pursued her heart and put his arms around her, made it right, and made her perfect. See, our God loves us and pursues us. We are the bride of Christ. And apart from him, we are lost and every single one of us is unfaithful. Every single one of us. But God came for his bride and he's coming back. And Jesus wants to set us all free. And that's his heart. The heart of God is that he loves his bride. He forgives his bride. He dies for her. He does whatever it takes to get her right in relationship with him. So the true story is not actually about us. It's very much about him. God has chosen his bride. He's made an eternal covenant. 
She abandoned and betrayed him, and he divorced her. He forgave her and died for her, and he's coming back for her. Jesus is the groom, and we are the bride, and he is fighting for us. He is coming back to take us home. He's faithful, and we have all been unfaithful. He paid the price, even when we abandoned him. And he goes before us and makes a way for us. Jesus is the redeemer and the restorer and the lover of our souls, and he fights for us. Would you stand and we'll pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. It's a heavy subject. But I thank you, God, that you love us and that you never gave up on us and that you're coming back for us. God, I thank you that your mercy is greater than our failures and our sin. God, I know that there's a lot of broken situations in this room that are playing out in in horrible ways. And God, I ask for your grace on those situations. Right now, Lord, we ask that you would pour out your mercy and your grace in those, right in the middle of those situations, that people would not walk through these things alone. God, I pray for redemption, for healing. God, I pray that you would hold our families together by the power of your grace. We need you, Lord, to fight against the tide that's coming at us, and we can't do it without you. And so we ask for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. You have a great week. Thanks for being here.